Our Father, we thank you for the worship of this day. Thank you for your people. Thank you for the love, the interest you've given every one of us to be in your presence. We're praying that you'll bless everyone mightily today as we worship and listen to your word in Jesus' name. And we pray that your grace will be available for every one of us so that we can do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to remind ourselves today of the wonderful things that God has been doing for every one of us since we believed on Christ as Savior and as Lord. In God's own love and goodness, He has given us the greatest of all gifts, Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. And He has given us eternal life as we have believed on Him. Because he died for us on the cross of Calvary. Not only that we have been saved, Jesus rose from the dead. And then he went to the Father's right hand. So that he can carry on the intercessory ministry praying for us. And right now he's preparing a place for us. So that after all things have been well prepared, he'll come, he'll take us unto himself. For Christ to do all this for us, he emptied himself of all things, so that he can make all these blessings available for every one of us. Now he expects us to show gratitude to God and to consecrate all we are and all we have unto him. He has delivered us from bondage. He has delivered us from death. And now he calls us to complete consecration. And gratitude from our heart should make us to yield ourselves to Him because of what He has done, because of what He has suffered, because of what He has given, and because of what He is doing for us right now. He is expecting that in gratitude and faithfulness we we'll yield and surrender ourselves to Him. In Exodus chapter 32, Verse 29, For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing. These people had been redeemed from bondage. These people had been saved from years of toil and slavery. But now they were being called after they had backslidden, but then they were given a chance to repent and come to the Lord again. And Moses had told them, Ask them, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. As the Levites responded, And they gave themselves afresh and new to the Lord. Then Moses told them, If you are really giving yourself to the Lord, In gratitude that he has not dealt with you, According to the number of your sins, But he has forgiven you. He has pardoned you, and He has made new life to come upon you. Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, so that He will bestow upon you a blessing from this very day. In fact, when the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, this was the thing they were faced with. Complete consecration, entire consecration to the Lord who had saved them. In Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify yourselves unto me. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whoso, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast. It is mine. At that early time, the Lord had requested that the children of Israel will offer their firstborn unto him. Not a sacrifice to die, but a sacrifice to lay. Living sacrifices to be given unto the Lord, their firstborn. Why did you request that from them? We must go back to Exodus chapter 12 to fully understand why God was requesting from the children of Israel that all their firstborn should be given to him 
in complete consecration. Exodus chapter 12 from verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. All the firstborn of Egypt had died under judgment. But all the firstborn of Israel had escaped the judgment. All the firstborn, even of the beasts of Egypt, had died and perished because of the sin of the land. But all the beasts of Israel had been spared from the judgment and the plague because of the mercy of God, the love of God, and the goodness of God. And now God said, All those that should have suffered judgment of death, perdition, destruction, but have forgiven them, have spared them, have delivered them, let them now serve me. And the same thing the Lord is telling us today. We should have died in the judgment of God. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But the Lord has shown mercy unto us. He has called us unto himself. Because he has called us. Because he has given himself unto us. Because of the blood that has redeemed us. There is a call coming from the Lord today. And that is the call to complete consecration. That's what we are talking about today. Complete consecration. You have been saved. You have been delivered. You have escaped the judgment of God. You have passed from death unto life. You have tasted of the goodness of the Lord coming from Calvary through Jesus Christ who died on the cross. Then there is a call that if God has done so much for us and has redeemed us, we are called unto entire consecration. We are called unto complete consecration. One will see the expectation of Christ. Two will see the examples of consecration. And three will see experiences following consecration. The expectation of Christ. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. My son, the Lord here is talking to the redeemed, those who have been washed in the blood. And if you think about the cost that it cost God to give you Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ to die on the cross of Calvary, before you could become his son, because we were all slaves before and servants of sin before. But just because of his goodness and mercy and because of the agony of Jesus Christ on the cross, now we are forgiven. Now we are children of God. He says, my son, what are you going to give me for all that I've done? How are you going to show your gratitude for all that I've done for you? Give me thine heart. That's all I need. And let your eyes observe my ways. God demanded entire consecration from Israel after they were redeemed from slavery. And today God demands the same from us after we have been redeemed from the slavery of sin and Satan. Sinners are expected to first turn from their sins, to throw their sins upon the rubbish heap. Get or seek forgiveness from God through Christ, the sin bearer. Backsliders are supposed to come to the Lord to start with. Because we cannot offer a sinful heart, a defiled heart, unto the Lord. But after sin and evil had been taken away, you cannot bring that to the altar for sacrifice or consecration. After sin had been forgiven and the evil had been purged away, you become a child of God. And as children of God, the Lord is calling every one of his own children, My son, give me your heart. Let your eyes delight in my ways. Observe my ways. 
But let us understand, He wants our sins to be cleansed up first. He wants all impurity to be taken away from our lives first. And then, after we become children of God, no more backsliders, no more sinners, by practice and by choice, then we give ourselves completely unto Him. Malachi chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? If ye offer the lame or sick, is it not evil? evil? Offer it now unto your governor. Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, says the Lord of hosts? Here the Lord was saying that the children of Israel should not offer anything polluted, blind, evil, lame, sick unto him. Sinners are, sin are sick with sin. Their heart is sick. Their spirits are sick. In fact, sinners are told that they are blind. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. Sinners are evil doers. And sinners cannot offer themselves unto the Lord because that type of sacrifice will not be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. But before we can offer ourselves to the Lord, we must be cleansed. Our sins must be taken away. And we must become children of God by faith in Christ. It is after that point you have become a child of God. The Lord is calling upon you, my son. Give me your heart. Consecrate your heart to me. Put everything on the altar. See what I've given you. See what I've given for your salvation. Now you give yourself to me in return. In gratitude because of what I have done for you. In Luke chapter 14. Expectation of Christ. Luke chapter 14. Verse 33. So likewise, whoso he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Here the Lord is saying, once you are born again, once you are saved, offer yourself completely unto me. You cannot withhold your heart, your affection, your love, your possession. You cannot withhold your life away from the Christ that has saved you. Remember, that life would have been worth nothing were it not for the salvation of the Lord. Remember, you would have been under the burden, under the guilt and the load of your sin. Were it not for the suffering of Christ on Calvary? Now that he has done all that for you, he left heaven. He left glory land. And he came here and was born in a manger. And he suffered so many years over here. Eventually, he went to the cross. He offered himself. Now that he has done all that for you, wouldn't you, in gratitude, faithfulness to the Lord, say, Lord, now I offer myself. And this is the expectation of the Lord, that you will forsake all things for his sake, and you will give yourself completely unto him, so that you can be his disciple. In the Old Testament, they were told about what to do, or in what attitude they must keep themselves. If they were offering their self, themselves and devoting themselves unto the Lord. In Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 28. Leviticus 27, 28. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing, that means consecrated thing, that a man shall devote or consecrate unto the Lord of all that he has, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy, set apart unto the Lord. The Lord told the children of Israel that that which has been consecrated or devoted or set apart unto God cannot be taken back. You see, my brothers and sisters, the moment you became a child of God, you should understand that what should follow is entire consecration complete consecration and then you will not withdraw yourself away from the Lord anymore then it says it cannot even be made merchandise or you cannot sell it 
to any man. You cannot sell it anymore. Even to this world, the Lord has redeemed you. And is expecting that what he has redeemed will be useful unto him. So, you will not sell yourself into the hands of the devil anymore. You will not sell yourself into the hands of man anymore. But you will be completely consecrated and devoted unto the Lord. Neither will you assert authority over whatever you have given to the Lord anymore. Think about the children of Israel. That they are devoted a beast or the first child, the first son unto the Lord. After they had devoted that first son unto the Lord, or that beast unto the Lord, they will not be able to assert authority over that again. That is, they lift up their hands, they remove their hands from that thing. It's given to the Lord. They do not have control, authority, over that thing anymore. When you have given yourself to the Lord, you will not continue to assert authority over what you have given to the Lord. All you will now say is that, Lord, thy will be done. It belongs to you. My heart, my life, my plans, everything about my life has been consecrated unto you. Therefore, I do not assert authority over any part of my life anymore. Thy will be done. Under the old dispensation, they brought the sacrifices of heifers, goats, lambs, turtle doves as offerings. But now under the new dispensation, the Lord requires the consecration of our hearts and of our lives. Let's look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 from verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. The animals that were sacrificed to the Lord those days, they faced death. But today, the sacrifices we bring to the Lord are living sacrifices. But the only thing is that we do not have authority over that thing anymore. We cannot do as we please over whatever we are sacrificing to the Lord anymore. That means when the apostle by the inspiration of the Spirit of God said, present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means consecrate your life, your body. And everything that that entails, consecrate everything to the Lord. Don't take it back. Let it remain on the altar. Don't sell it to the devil. Don't sell it to the world. Don't sell it to anything that the devil, the, the agencies of the devil, anything that the devil has raised up in this world. But give it totally to the Lord. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Have you ever done that? That's what the Bible says. That means like the children of Israel took their animals in those days. And they pulled that animal by the rope or they carried it in any way and they brought it before the Lord and they deliberately presented it before the Lord. That's what the believer is to do today. In a very definite act of consecration that will bring your body and you bring all your time, you bring everything that you have and everything that you are unto the Lord in living sacrifice. Sacrifice. But a continual sacrifice to the Lord, living. Every time, every day you have an opportunity to live, you say, Lord, I still offer this to you. I still consecrate this to you. I still devote this unto you. And it's a sign of my gratitude. Anytime I withdraw anything to you, it's a sign of being ungrateful. But every time I come before you, I'm presenting my body, my life, my time, my heart unto you. Holy, acceptable sacrifice unto God. This is your reasonable service. I want to see point two. Examples of consecration in the word of God. We have many, many examples of consecration. But I'll just uh, go through a few with you. Of course, Jesus is a perfect example of what true consecration really is. Let's see the consecration of Jesus Christ in John chapter 17. 
verse 19. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. That means I devote myself. I consecrate myself. I set myself apart. That they also might be sanctified through the truth. Here is the consecration of Jesus Christ being mentioned. He said, for the sake of those that will believe. For your own sake, for my own sake. He set apart himself. Think about Jesus when he came into this world. A lot of things he could have done that he didn't do. A lot of things that the Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted him to do that he couldn't do. A lot of things that the general common people wanted him to do that he couldn't do. Why? Because he set apart himself for your good, for your salvation. If he did all those things they wanted him to do at that time, you would not have been saved. They didn't want him to go to Calvary. Peter didn't want him to go to Calvary. But he said, I devote myself to do that for the sake of the people that will believe and be saved. The people wanted him to be king and to be giving them bread and meat and whatever it is they needed. But he couldn't accept that offer because of your salvation and my salvation. He has given us a perfect example of consecration. For their sakes, I sanctify myself. I devote myself. In talking about his consecration, here is what he said in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Therefore does my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay down myself. That's consecration. No man takes it from me, but voluntarily. I commit myself, I devote myself to this because I see this is the will of God. And this is for the salvation of the whole world. I lay down my life for the sheep. No man taketh it from me, but I lay down myself. And in consecration, you lay down yourself. You obey the commandment of the Lord that says, My son, give me your heart. Give me your life. Let those plans come under my authority. Do not assert your authority over your life anymore, over your property anymore. Whatever you have, lay that down as a sacrifice, well pleasing unto the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering, thou wouldest not, but a body as thou prepared me, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Jesus, in his consecration, said, I have come. To do thy will, O God. You see, a person that has consecrated himself is not seeking to please himself. He's not seeking to go his own way. He's not he's seeking to speak his own words. He's seeking to please the Lord alone. In John, Gospel according to St. John, chapter 8 and verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. You see the extent of consecration? I do nothing of myself. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. I say nothing of myself. I plan nothing of myself. I do nothing of myself. As the Father has desired, so I do. That's consecration. And Jesus has given us that perfect example. Consecration is the presenting of our hearts, presenting of our plans, presenting of our will, presenting of our future hopes, presenting of our possessions and talents and abilities unto God to fulfill His will. We have no personal will, selfish will, private will, secret will to fulfill anymore. There is nothing we are thinking of planning that cannot see the light of day anymore. The consecrated man, the consecrated woman says, Lord, not my will, thy will be done. And I will gladly do anything, go anywhere, say anything. That will be the will of God, whatever the inconveniences that will expose you to. 
Some people make a great profession of being greatly consecrated unto God, but they are not. And you can tell they are not fully consecrated unto God because they give excuses for not doing some humble service for God. You see, God takes note of that. When you make great professions of saying that you are consecrated to God, but then you are selective in what you can do. There are some humble tasks that you will not give yourself to in the church or in the community. You are not seeking only the glory of God. You see, that's not consecration. You are seeking after your own recognition. That's not consecration. You are seeking after your own pleasure, after your own satisfaction. That is not consecration. When you are consecrated, you do not have any authority on what you have and who you are anymore. All that you have is, thy will be done. Am I supposed to be a cleaner in the church? O oh Lord, thy will be done. An usher in the church? O oh Lord, thy will be done. Am I supposed to be in the choir? O oh Lord, thy will be done. What am I supposed to do? To wash the disciples' feet? O oh Lord, thy will be done. Am I only to visit the sick? And that's all I do? O oh Lord, thy will be done. My time is in your hand. I cannot exert authority over it anymore. But you see, when we have attitudes of, I cannot do that. I will not do that. I will not spend my life that way. I will not go in that direction. When we say, Lord, this is what I want to do, because that will give me honor and recognition, my brother and my sister, that's not uh, consecration. Jesus gave us an example. And the example he gave us is that, Father, not my will, thy will be done. In the examples and illustrations we see in the Bible, we learn that consecration must be entire. That means it must cover everything in our lives. Consecration cannot be just partial. That, Lord, I give you this area to watch over. I give you this area to be Lord over. But all these other areas, you cannot be Lord over it. And the consecration, as we learn from the Bible, must be irrevocable. That means it embraces all time, it embraces all seasons. Not that we are consecrated at one period of the year and not consecrated another period of the year again. Not that at one time in our lives we have given everything to the Lord, but and at another time in our lives we have pulled back. We have withdrawn from the altar what we laid on the altar before. Two things you must understand about consecration. One, entire, complete. It covers everything in your life. Number two, irrevocable. You cannot pull anything back. It embraces all times and all seasons. Let me show you some four aspects that you need to seriously consider in consecration. The first aspect is consecration to the king in such a way that you bear his reproach. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, 2 Samuel chapter 15 from verse 19. In this story here, David was running away from Jerusalem. Absalom wanted to take away the throne from David. And David was under great soul torture, great agony of spirit. And as he was going away from Jerusalem, in that reproach, in that agony, and in that suffering, a man came to him called Itai. And then he told this man, why will you follow after me? This is a time of reproach. This is a time of suffering. But this man Itai showed the essence of consecration, showed the extent of consecration and the meaning of consecration. You see, Jesus is the son of David. Jesus is the king of kings. But at this time, the world is reproaching him. At this time, the world is not totally and fully accepting him. The world will use his name, sometimes in a bad way, will jest about his name, and your consecration is illustrated in this story I'm going to read to you. That you are willing in your place of work, you are willing in your community to bear the reproach of the Lord. To bear the reproach of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Samuel chapter 15 verse 19. Then said the king to Itai, the, git, git, the Gittite, Wherefore goest thou also with us, return to thy place, 
and abide with the king. For thou art a stranger and also an exile. Whereas thou camest but yesterday, should I this day make thee go up and down with us? Seeing I go whither I may, return thou and take back thy brethren. Mercy and truth be with thee. This man had come with his own people, with his own brethren. And he said, David king, even though Absalom is already reigning, and Absalom is having the minds of the people of Israel, we're still for you. We're still following after you. Even though they are singing songs of praise after Absalom, and everybody is now ridiculing you and reproaching you, we'd like to suffer with you. We'd like to go on with you. Because you are the one that we know that God, the Father, has appointed. You know, in consecration, the world is not on the side of Jesus. Those who are not born again, they are on the side of the people of this world. They are, the, they are beside the heroes of this world, the kings of this world, their own self-appointed king. But Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, appointed by the Father, is now undergoing reproach and ridicule. And they make jest of him. And they make light of his name. In your consecration, what you are saying is that I do not recognize the kings of the world. I do not recognize the people of the world. I do not recognize the heroes of the world. Jesus Christ, set up by the Father. Jesus Christ, appointed by the Father. He is the one I know. And he is the one I'm going to follow. Not only that I follow him alone. I follow him with all my people. In verse 21. And it I answered the king and said, As the Lord liveth, and as my Lord the king liveth, surely in what place my Lord the king shall be, whether in death or in life, even there also will thy servant be. That's consecration. In what place Jesus Christ is being glorified, there will I be. In which place the word of Jesus is being obeyed, there will I be. In which place the doctrine of Christ is embraced, there will I be. In which place that Christ is obeyed without reservation, without interruption, there will I be. You see, that is consecration. And it is not popular in the world. The people of the world will not think that you are doing well because you are following Jesus Christ that way. In fact, to them, it's a reproach. But look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And I'm reading there verse 12 and verse 13. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Do you remember how they made jest of him on the cross? If you are the son of God, come down from the cross, that's reproach. Do you remember how that uh, thief on the cross even said, If you be the son of God, come down from the cross and deliver us to you. Do you remember how those people were? And do you remember how they wrote, He said he is the king of the Jews. If he is the king of the Jews, let him not deliver himself. Others are saved. He cannot save himself. That's reproach. But it says now in verse 13, Let us go forth therefore unto him, without the camp, bearing his reproach. That's consecration. When you go after the Lord in your place of work, they make jest of Christianity, you identify with Christ. They make fun of the way of Christ, you identify with Christ. They make fun of the people that are, say that they are going to heaven, you still identify with Christ. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. And in that way you will not please yourself, Romans. The epistle to the Romans. Chapter 15. Verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Consecration means that you know that Christ is the appointed king. is the son of David, the son of God, and you are going to follow after him. Now, consecration also means this. That you are consecrated to the point that you will defend God's glory. God's name, God's heritage. And you will do it tirelessly. Let me show you an example in the Bible. In 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 9 and 10. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, 
one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil. Here is another example of consecration. Remember, the Philistines were the enemies of the children of Israel. And God had raised up David that he will fight that battle. Fight the kingdom of Goliath, the kingdom of the Philistines. And the king David himself had done a lot. But then he had people around him and people behind him. And these people were so addicted, they were so consecrated, they were so devoted to the king that at this time they fought against the Philistines until for this man his hand was weary. But even though he was weary, he was tired, his hand clave unto the sword. That is, he will not stop fighting the battle of the Lord until the last enemy had been driven away. And that is an example of consecration for every one of us that we are to defend God's name, we are to defend God's heritage, we are to defend God's glory. How do we do that today? We do that today by proclaiming His word. That means tireless evangelism. You see, many people do not understand the extent of consecration. They think, well, thank God I'm not committing sin. What if this man would have just sat at home and he would say, Thank God, I'm not worshipping idol. Thank God, I'm keeping the Lord's day. Thank God, I honor my father, I honor my mother. Thank God, I'm keeping the Ten Commandments and everybody just sat at home, keeping the Ten Commandments. Israel would have been defeated by the Philistines. But then, this man showed an example of consecration. And he said, I thank God I'm keeping the commandments. I thank God I'm, I'm, I'm received by the Lord. And I thank God that all my sins have been washed away. All my sins have been blotted away. But now, I offer myself. I give myself. I consecrate myself. My brothers and sisters, that is consecration. It is not enough just to be born again. And just to say, I don't do this, I don't do that anymore. Consecration means that we'll give ourselves to defend the glory of God. To proclaim the word of God in tireless evangelism. Let me show you an example of this in the New Testament. Acts chapter 20. What consecration entails. Acts chapter 20. From verse 24. But none of these things move me. Paul was talking about difficulties, inconveniences, tiredness, hunger, and persecution. Paul was talking about all the things that the Holy Ghost was saying, that afflictions was waiting, were waiting for this man in Jerusalem. And yet he said, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. That's consecration. I'm not so, sort of petting myself. I'm not uh, trying to take care of myself in a way that I just hide myself in the room saying, well, I'm born again. I'm living a holy life. That's not enough. And he said, I count not my life down to myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify, to witness, to preach the gospel of the grace of God. You see, that is consecration. And if you are not doing evangelism in a tireless manner, in a way that even when people will say you've done enough, you're still keeping on. Even when people will say, now we're tired, the program is over today, you're still keeping on. You see, you are not consecrated enough to the Lord then. To be consecrated to the Lord means you don't have an authority over your time. You are not a certain authority over your possession. All the gifts that God has given you, what do you use them for? You use them to defend the glory of God, to proclaim the word of God, and to uh, accomplish the ministry of witnessing and testifying and preaching the gospel of the grace of God. Not only that, in Ruth chapter 1, we find another example of consecration. Ruth chapter 1. And I'm reading there from verse 8. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, 
go. Return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant you that she may find rest to each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. That's the expression of consecration. I didn't say the practice, the expression of consecration. Both Ruth and Upper, they expressed their consecration and commitment. Oh, they said, we'll be with you. We'll go back with you. We'll worship your God with you. But then he put them, she put them to the test and told them things that will determine whether they will get away from the expression of consecration and go to the practice of consecration. In verse 11, and Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb? That they may be your husbands. Turn again, my daughters. Go your way. For I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, and if I should have an, if, um, I should have an husband also tonight, and should bear also sons, will ye tarry for them till they have grown? Would ye stay for them? From having husbands, nay, my daughters, it grieveth me much for your sakes, that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and up a kiss her mother-in-law, but truth clave unto her. Upper could not follow through. There was a momentary decision, a momentary expression of consecration. We'll go with you, we'll never leave you, we'll follow after you, we'll worship the same God. That's an expression of consecration. But then she told them, count the cost. Won't you get married? Won't you settle down? Won't you raise up your home? Won't you do this? You see, that is what the devil is saying today to everyone. And will say, now this is your consecration in tireless evangelism. This is your consecration in defending the glory of God and proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is your consecration in bearing the reproach of the Lord. How will it affect your work? How will it affect your family? How will it affect your prospects? How will it affect your promotion? You see, the devil will exaggerate all these things as if the Lord himself is not thinking about those things. And so Opa went away from Ruth, uh, from, uh, Ruth and from Naomi. And then in verse 15, And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto our people and unto our gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For where thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God, my God. Where thou diest, I will die. And where, there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if all but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, she, then she left speaking unto her. That's an aspect of our consecration, the practice of consecration. It means consecration to live with God's chosen people. Consecration to keep on fellowshipping with God's chosen people until death. You see, Ruth did not have any other conditions attached unto her consecration. There are people that have conditions attached to their consecration. And they say, well, I'll be with God's chosen people if this happens, if that does not happen. I'll be with God's chosen people if I get this, if I don't get that. Naomi said, won't you get married? Won't you have a husband? Won't you establish a home of your own? Won't you have this? Won't you have that? And uh, Ruth said, let's leave that in the hand of God. You see, in consecration, we leave all those things in the hands of God. About family, about promotion, about prosperity, about what we are going to gain in this world. We leave all that in the hands of God in consecration. Our consecration is, the people of God shall be my people. The name of God will be my protection. And the chosen people of God will be my fathers, my mothers, my sisters, my brothers. And I will never separate from the chosen people of God until death. 
And then when I die, I'll go with God, I'll go to God's people in heaven. That's consecration. Look at Hebrews chapter eleven. Hebrews chapter eleven. Verse twenty five. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's consecration. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Oh yes, when you join God's chosen people, they'll call you names. They'll, they'll ridicule you. They'll bring reproach upon you. Oh, they'll say those people that follow the Bible completely, those are the people you are worshipping with. Those are the people you are interacting with. Those are the people of your fellowship. Those are your friends. Choosing rather to suffer affliction. Name calling. Choosing rather to suffer persecution of the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And therefore, if we are completely consecrated, we will be given totally to the Lord. Let me show you a fourth example of consecration. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of, of the king's meat, nor with the wine that he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. That he might not defile himself. That's consecration to remain holy and undefiled. You see, in this world, there are many practices of the world that are defiling. They will pollute your conscience. They will disturb your relationship with the Lord, with their drinks, with their cigarettes, with their evil practices, with their immorality, but then you make up your mind that God being your helper, the grace of God within you, and the word of God in your heart, you are not going to defile yourself. Come what may, whatever the people of the world will say, they might say, everybody is doing it, everybody is going that wrong direction, your consecration is that I will not defile myself by the things coming out of the system of the world. Dan Daniel purposed in his heart, he determined in his heart, I'm going to serve God. And I'm going to serve him acceptably. I'm going to obey his word. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened. In his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four times. Do you know that's consecration? Daniel had known about the writing of the decree in this kingdom that if anybody will pray to Almighty God for the space of 30 days, that person will be thrown in the lion's den. After Daniel knew that the writing had been signed, he went into his house and said, Eternal God, all these kingdoms will come and go. All these lawmakers will come and go. Even this world one day will be burnt in fire and will be rolled away. But heaven is eternal. God is eternal. The angels of God are eternal. And I know that the salvation you have given me will take me out of this kingdom and will take me to the region beyond. Will take me to the kingdom everlasting. Already he had seen the great uh, revelation of um, the kingdom of the ancient of days. Of the kingdom of God that will circle all over this world. When he interpreted the dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And he knew that all these kingdoms will come and go. And he must keep on praying to the Lord. My brothers and sisters, kingdoms come and go. Authorities come and go. Politicians come and go. And the decrees and the rules come and go. But the worship of the Lord must always continue. And so Daniel, in consecration to the Lord, he said, I will serve the Lord. I cannot wait 30 days and not appear before my God. You know, they may say that you cannot worship the Lord. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. It is not permissible that you will do this or that. When you are consecrated to the will of the Lord, when you are consecrated to God himself, you say, Lord, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. 
And we're reading there in verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. That's their consecration. That should be our consecration today. But what do we gain? If we are consecrated to the Lord, experiences following consecration. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 32. And let's see what the Lord is telling us that we're going to have, we're going to get, we're going to experience if we're fully consecrated unto the Lord. Consecrated to the Lord without reservation. Consecrated to the Lord without interruption. Consecrated to the Lord entirely. Everything in our lives totally consecrated on the altar of sacrifice. Exodus 32 verse 29. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourself today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. You see, consecration attracts many blessings from the Lord. Daniel, again, chapter 1. Daniel, chapter 1. I've read verse 8 unto you, and you have seen the consecration of that man. And then let's look at verse 15. And at the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. They didn't suffer for their consecration. They were blessed for their consecration. Verse 17. As for these four children, that means Daniel, were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Verse 20. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all Israel. There is blessing in consecration. You remember when he was thrown to the lion's den, he was preserved. And later when, I, when he came out of that lion's den, he was promoted. Preservation and promotion come after and come after you have consecrated yourself to the Lord. Malachi chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Then they that feared the Lord spake upon one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name, and they shall be mine. Says the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Many blessings attend consecration unto the Lord. When we fully consecrate ourselves unto the Lord, God has promised a hundredfold return of whatever we consecrate to his honor and to his glory and to his kingdom. God is no man's debtor, and he always fulfills his promises. These blessings will come upon us here on earth, and also untold eternal blessings will be ours in heaven when we have finished our race on earth. You see, many of our neighbors, they think we give up too much to serve the Lord. They say, we're always at the Sunday worship. We're always at the Thursday revival hour. We're always studying the Bible here on Monday. We're always evangelizing. They see us carrying our Bibles and carrying tracts and carrying materials and going on to evangelize. They say, we visit people, we help people, we care for people too much. But they do not understand. We do that because God has commanded it. We do that because we know that when we have done all that consecrating unto the Lord, many, many blessings come upon us. Oh yes, it is true. Our days seem busy, very busy, with activities that honor God, that proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet we understand, the more we give wholeheartedly unto God, the more we shall receive from the Lord. In Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, from verse 28, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all, and we have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or land for my sake, and the gospels, but shall receive an hundredfold now in this life, 
Think about it. For you to receive an hundredfold of whatever you are giving up, whatever you are consecrating, whatever you are offering to the Lord, how much then will you receive? And remember, the promises of God are ye and amen in Christ. Remember, God is no man's debtor. Remember, He will fulfill all the promises He has given us in this very life. He shall receive an hundredfold now in this time. Houses, brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands with persecution. And in the world to come, eternal life. In the world to come, eternal life. But many that are forced shall be last, and the last shall be forced. Now that means that sometimes you realize that the last to come are the most zealous people. Those who have first come, they withdraw their zeal. Therefore they will be last. We must be careful those of us who have been here for a long time. Now we have married, now we have settled down. Now the Lord has blessed us since we came. We must be careful that we do not withdraw our, our consecration to the Lord. Because it says many. It doesn't say all that are first shall be last. No, that's not it. He said many that are forced, many of them, they will be withdrawing their consecration. They will not want to serve the Lord like they served the Lord years ago. They will not want to commit themselves and consecrate themselves unto the Lord totally like they did many, many years ago. Those people, Jesus said, they shall be last and the last false. That is many of the people that are just coming into the church, coming into the kingdom of God with zeal, with consecration, with commitment to the Lord, God will give them abundance of blessings. Unfaithful people are asking, what can I withdraw from my consecration so I can live an easier life? But those who are grateful to God and those who are faithful as believers are asking, Oh Lord, what else can I offer to you? Upon the altar of consecration, I want to offer you more time, more of my dedication, more of my sacrifice, more of my time more of my desires, more of my abilities, more of my talents. Lord, what else can I offer to you to the glory of your name? The Lord is calling us today. Offer yourself to the Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all other things you desire will be added unto you. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in consecration. In consecration. Saying, Lord, I've heard your word. Now I will offer myself entirely. I will offer myself entirely. My son, give me your heart. I offer myself unto you. Are you saved? Consecrate yourself this day then unto the Lord. If you are not saved yet, remember Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary to save you. Offer yourself unto the Lord. Are you getting tired before the end of the journey? Are you complaining of loving God too much? Giving God too much? Serving God too much? Don't you know there is blessing if you consecrate more of your life to the Lord? The blessing of a hundredfold. Now in this life and in the world to come life eternal.